Good afternoon. I'm Carol Chris, Chancellor of UC Berkeley. It's my privilege and my pleasure to welcome all of you to this year's 109th annual Martin Meyerson Faculty Research Lecturers. It is so wonderful to see you here in person and to be able to gather together for this event. For more than a century, Berkeley's Academic Senate has singled out distinguished members of our faculty whose research has changed the trajectory of their disciplines and of our understanding. These lectures shine a light on an essential part of our mission, the creation of new knowledge. The curiosity and creativity that fuel the quest to learn and to understand are at the heart of Berkeley's core commitment to making the world a better place through what we discover, through what we teach, and through the public service that we provide. This year's pair of lectures represent the continuation of a treasured tradition that has recurred annually, with one exception. In 1919, in the wake of World War I and the influenza pandemic, the faculty research lectures were suspended. Unfortunately, there was no Zoom back then, and our predecessors were unable to do as we did last year when virtual events were in vogue, and these lectures went on. I should note that today's lecture will be recorded and available to view on YouTube or from the Faculty Research Lectures website for those who are unable to join us today. Being selected to deliver a faculty research lecture is rightfully seen as one of the highest honors that Berkeley can bestow on its own, on a member of our faculty, to stand out among peers who exemplify academic excellence is no small thing. For students, members of the campus community, and the public we serve, this is all a unique and wonderful forum that offers access for all to scholarly research of the highest caliber. I'd like to ask that you join me in welcoming the past faculty research lecturers who are with us today. Professors, please stand as I read your name, but let's hold our applause until everyone has been recognized. Alexander Chorin. John Clark, Fred Cruz, Catherine Gallagher, Tim Hampton, Marty J, Thomas LeCur, and Stephen, Stephen Lindau, and Birgitta Whaley. The two individuals chosen by our Academic Senate to give the 2022 faculty research lecturers are David H. Rollet, who will speak to us today, and Timothy Hampton, who will deliver his lecture next Monday. A few words of introduction for Professor Rollet. David Rollet is Distinguished Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology and the Esther and Wendy Sheckman Chair in Cancer Biology. He also serves as faculty director of Berkeley's Immunotherapeutics and Vaccine Research Initiative. He's been recognized with many awards for his scientific con contributions, including election as a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and being named a distinguished fellow of the American Association of Immunologists. Our university has established itself as a center of breakthrough research in cancer immunotherapy, starting with the pioneering work of former faculty member and Nobel laureate, Jim Allison. Today, David Rollet is not only carrying on this tradition of innovation and discovery, he's taking it in exciting new directions. Rollet's research addresses how the immune system recognizes and responds to cancer cells and virus-infected cells. While his early work focused on T lymphocytes, Current research focuses on another cellular player in our immune system, the natural killer cell. Related to T cells, natural killer cells employ completely different strategies to attack cancerous and infected cells. And Relay has discovered essential ingredients of their capacity for recognizing and destroying many types of cancer cells. Relay's recent work aims to understand why, in some cancer patients, natural killer cells fail to activate or become inactive, part of his ongoing quest 
to decipher the mechanism of cell activation in order to devise therapeutic approaches that will mobilize natural killer cells to eliminate cancers. Today, he will present a lecture entitled, Not All Killers Are Bad, How Natural Killer Cell Cells Protect You From Cancer. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Professor David Grillet. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Christ. Um, uh, and thank you for being our chancellor, by the way. We love you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk today about um, natural killer cells and how they protect you from cancer and to you know, explore ways that we may mobilize them for immunotherapy of cancer. Uh, to start with, I uh, must uh, disclose uh, relationships with uh, biotechs that I have here. And, um, and I want to start in, by really acknowledging all the wonderful colleagues we have and that have made such an impact on the research in, in my laboratory over these, uh, I don't know, 30 years that I've been at Berkeley. And so here are the colleagues in the Division of Immunology and Molecular Medicine. It's really been an incredible experience to be around these people. They've had such an impact on our work, um, and, and I'm really grateful for that. And I'm, in addition to, to the current members, I want to acknowledge uh, former member Neelab Shastri, who passed away recently, and of course, Jim Allison, that, uh, who Carol mentioned, had such a formative role in our division and also in, in cancer therapy. And I also need to acknowledge uh, the larger molecular and cell biology department. I borrowed this slide from Rebecca Heald. So it's, it's a really a compilation of a much larger department and, it's, and the impact of all the different kinds of research that goes on here at Berkeley has been incredibly um, informative for the work we do, and I'm grateful for that as well. And finally, of course, I have to thank my laboratory, and this is a historical talk. I'm gonna cover some decades, really, of work that we've done in a sort of narrative form, and I want to um, acknowledge all the, all the people in the lab who've done this work over these many years. I think probably missing some people in these various group photos, but this covers uh, a lot of the, t of the time. So, so thank you, guys. I'm not, obviously not gonna be able to talk about everyone's work, but. But, I, but the work we do is informed by the work that all these people did. And uh, this is a recent group photo in a, in a retreat that we had. And I have to, I have to shout out to Lily Zong, who's, a, who's a, the manager of our lab, which has been with me for 22 years now, I think, and really um, makes the lab run well. And she's, um, I have to say, puts up with me, so that's, that's a good thing. And, uh, and then that light, I have to acknowledge my family as well, who are here, Elisa, uh, Michael, and Gabriel. And, and what, you know, they put up with me too. And that's, that's, that's great. And um, actually my sisters are here as well, Anais and Risa, and they put up with me for a really long time. So thanks for that. So um, the main takeaway I'd like to um, make today for those of you who are not uh, in the field is that curiosity-driven studies of cellular and molecular mechanisms drive the invention of new medicines and applications. And I'll take you through our work that we hope is leading in that direction and um, mention as well some other work along the way. So I'm gonna do a kind of deep historical dive here into the you know, immunology and um, going back now to actually to 1800 when you know, Jenter, Jenner invented the smallpox vaccine and of course Pasteur invented several other vaccines in, in the late 1800s. And what's remarkable about, about them is that they, they really had no concept of an immune system dedicated to protecting us against uh, pathogens or cancer. They really didn't know how, how vaccination worked did work and so they exploited it. And it really wasn't until around 1890 or 1900 that antibodies were discovered by von Behring. And over the next years, immunity was attributed largely to antibodies, these proteins that can recognize things, or to phagocytes, which are cells, of course, that eat other cells. Uh, and it wasn't until the late 1960s that the era of cellular immunity was born, really, with the discovery of T cells. And these are cells that kill other cells in our body and uh, the concept is that killing infected cells prevents a virus or other pathogen from replicating within that cell and therefore can limit the infection. And killing nascent tumor cells obviously has obvious value as well. So um, this background, I wanna introduce T cell recognition because it's really the starting point for my presentation. So uh, T cells, uh, recognize what we call you know, antigens, and antigens are what the immune system 
recognizes. So think spike protein of COVID. And COVID's been great for educating people about immunology a little bit. Um, and, um, but what's key in this recognition and different from antibodies is that it involves these proteins called MHC proteins that are displayed on the surface of every cell in our body. So that's the blue thing here. And, and there are, they are antigen presenting molecules. And what they do is they survey the otherwise hidden you know, internal contents of cells for antigens. And then they pre present them on the outside membrane of the cell for recognition by the immune system. So in the example of a viral protein, that's a long polypeptide chain. It's, it's degraded into, into peptide fragments, which bind to this protein. Then they're displayed on the outside. And then T cells have a so-called antigen receptor, which enables them to recognize that complex. And they have different T cells have different specificity for different antigens. And when it interacts, it's a, um, it's a, it's a yeah, pathogens can run, but they can't hide. And inside cells is my point there. So these antigen receptors um, are triggers, and, the, and when, they, when they recognize and bind to the complex here, it triggers them to, to dump cytotoxic molecules onto the surface of the target cell and to kill it. So that's really the, the, how both T cells actually and NK cells kill uh, target cells, although the, as we'll see, the receptors used are different. So um, now this, this was our understanding is around, you know, in the 1980s, but it rapidly became clear there's many other molecules uh, interacting between T cells and other cells, not just the T cell antigen receptor, but other molecules. And I'm, you know, many of them, but, but there was some that were particularly interesting and that uh, were being studied in the early 1990s by many of us. Uh, and one that Jim Allison seized on was this receptor protein called CTLA-4. And it, it's on T cells, and, and Jim uh, proposed that it, it engages molecules on other cells, and in so doing, that it inhibits the T cell. So this was a different idea, that it was, it was actually preventing killing of a target cell. And he made the specific jump then to suggest that maybe this inhibits T cell responses to cancer. And that, and that perhaps you could block that interaction with an antibody against C CTLA-4 <clears throat> and therefore unleash the T cell to kill the cancer cell. So this, this was the concept. You block that interaction, the inhibition is gone, and now the T cell can kill the target cell. And remarkably, that worked in, in the first animal experiments he did. And that led to the uh, development of this approach in, in industry. And I have to give a shout out to my colleague, uh, friend, Alan Corman, who's in the audience, who was working at Metarex and then at Bristol Myers Squibb, and who oversaw the development of, of a human antibody that, that did this. And this, of course, turned out to be very important therapeutic, the first checkpoint therapy. This, these are called checkpoint receptors. And, and this shows you know, clinical trial data 10 years out for patients with metastatic melanoma that would, you know, other, even with chemo, there was very little help for these people. But a fraction of people, about 20%, would survive for essentially permanently with uh, this, this therapy. And indeed, if it was later combined with additional similar uh, approaches to block other checkpoint receptors, the, the uh, outcomes have been improved uh, really substantially to greater than 50% long-term survival. So this, this really caused a, really a revolution in, in cancer therapy. I think I would argue it's the single biggest you know, cancer therapy breakthrough in, I don't know, 50 or more years, if not more. And of course, Jim was awarded the Nobel Prize for this work, but it's also caused a revolution in the field of, of cancer therapy and in, in, the, in the biotech industry as well. So, um, the, um, I should point out that this therapy is also effective against numerous other types of cancer, but um, not all cancers. <laughs> so there's still a huge unmet need for treating uh, cancer patients be beyond this. So we were studying, and I wanna go back in time a little bit earlier. So we were studying T cell development when this story I'm gonna tell you was initiated. And we wanted to define how killer T cells develop from immature cells and then become activated during an immune response. So this, I say, was curiosity-driven, basic science question. And the question we asked was, what role does MHC play in T cell development? And, and to do that, we wanted to test it in mice, a useful animal for immunology research, with mutations so that they were in, in MHC components so that they did not have any MHC on their cells. 
And uh, we were fortunate that we collaborated with Rudolf Janisch, our colleague, a colleague of, of MIT, where I was at the time. And um, Janisch had, was one of the first uh, to successfully generate a so-called knockout mouse, where you could take a, a normal lab mouse and through a feat of genetic engineering uh, and a lot of time and effort, you could generate a, a mutation in a component of MHC, for example, and then generate a pup that, that lacked that, and then finally a mouse strain that lacked MHC proteins on all their cells. So this was a very important technique, and it's been replaced by Jennifer Doudna's CRISPR technology more recently, which is much easier to do. So uh, it took it by storm and quickly. So, um, so we studied these mice in collaboration with the Anish lab, and we showed that MHC-deficient mice lack killer T cells altogether. So not only is MHC important for presenting antigens, it's actually important for the development of T cells from immature stem cells. And that was an interesting and important finding. We wanted to understand it better. And so we um, did so. And uh, of course, this led to a chance observation that diverted us. And this was work by a graduate student in the lab, Mark Bix, and a postdoctoral fellow, Nanxi Liao. And they, they decided to investigate the following question. Do the T cells themselves need to have functioning MHC genes? Or do they need to interact with MHC displayed on other cell types? Um, and so this was important for various reasons. And to ask this question, we decided to perform bone marrow transplants from MHC deficient mice to normal mice. So this was a way you could have bone marrow from one source and the rest of the animal from another source. And so the idea was to prepare bone marrow cells from MHC deficient mice. And that has all the stem cells that form all the blood cells. And then you would take a normal mouse that has MHC on all its cells, and you treat the mouse to destroy most of its own blood cells, and then you give it the transplant to replace the blood cell system with the donor type uh, stem cells. And then they would, of course, develop into mature cells with time, and you could then see what happened. Well, we did this experiment, and much to our, own, much to our surprise, the mice receiving the MHC deficient marrow cells became very ill seven to 10 days later, and we had to euthanize. And this was completely unexpected. Um, we really didn't expect that to happen. So the question was, did the, what happened here? And did the MHC deficient bone marrow cells fail to engraft? And the symptoms and the timing of this syndrome were consistent with bone marrow failure where donor bone marrow cells fail to engraft and you ultimately get anemia as a consequence. So we thought perhaps the MHC deficient marrow cells were being rejected by the normal mice and the sort of transplant rejection type response. But bone marrow cells, the bone marrow cells we were using lacked the MHC molecules. And normally you need MHC molecules for graft rejection. That's what T cells actually target in graft rejection. And also the recipient mice should lack T cells due to the pretreatments we perform. So they don't have any T cells, in theory at least. So it seemed unlikely that T cells were responsible. But there were hints that another type of cell was involved, the so-called natural killer cells. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute before I introduce natural killer cells in a little bit more um, detail. So what are they? They were discovered in the mid 1970s as uh, cells, lymphocytes like T cells, present in mice or in humans, and they killed tumor cells. That was their, how they were initially defined. They were called natural because they were present without previous exposure to the cancer cells. Um, as late as 1990, there was no understanding of how they recognized cancer cells. There was, you know, we knew nothing about their receptors, they were basically, as we say, naked cells with no known antigen receptors. We had no idea how they would recognize any target cell. They killed numerous types of tumor cells, which you would think would be exciting, but actually <laughs> immunologists at the time didn't like that because they were uh, fascinated at the discriminatory powers of T cells or antibodies. And so they considered these cells boring, if you will. And um, as a result, there was, um, you know, really not that much interest in them. And others were actually even skeptical that they existed. They thought there was some sort of artifact or some kind of weird T cell or something like that. So they were the, I like to say, the Rodney Dangerfield of cells. And, and I was raised in that, in that environment where, you know, we disrespected natural killer cells and I was not particularly interested in that. But um, we thought maybe they have a role though in this, in this bone marrow rejection phenomenon. And, and to test it, we, we asked whether if you deplete NK cells from the recipients, do you reverse the rejection? And indeed, that was the case. So, so the way we could do this is you can deplete NK cells by injecting specific antibodies, and a day later, all the NK cells are gone. 
So here's the experiment. We can, we can quantify the amount of graft acceptance here. And when we transfer normal bone marrow to normal recipients, you know, very nice graft acceptance. But again, the MHC deficient marrow was actually completely rejected. But if we depleted the NK cells immediately before the transplant, the grafts were accepted perfectly well. So that you know, made the strong case that NK cells were indeed rejecting these, uh, these MHC deficient bone marrow cells. And suddenly they seemed extremely interesting to us. It was claimed that they were nonspecific and did not recognize MHC, but clearly MHC did influence the rejection of the bone marrow cells by NK cells. So MHC was recognized in a way but the mode of recognition was very different because immune cells were thought to recognize the presence of foreign things, right? That's how we generally think about it. But NK cells somehow detected the absence of a self thing. So really they flipped around in terms of the, what was going on here. So how can that even work? It was, it was unexpected and unprecedented at the time. So um, the hypothesis arose, and, and by the way, we didn't do all this work in isolation, there were many people uh, uh, that were working in the field, but um, I can't, I don't have time to, to call out everyone in the field. But there, were, um, there was a hypothesis that NK cells have a new class of receptors that bind to MHC. And the idea was that um, these receptors, instead of activating the NK cell, inhibited them. And this, by the way, was before Jim Allison's work, so the notion of you know, checkpoint inhibitory receptors was not out there. If anything, Jim may have been influenced by, by this kind of work. But, um, so, but this concept was completely new, that there was inhibitory recognition and that the MHC binding would actually inhibit NK cells and prevent them from killing target cells. So this, this is one way this could work. And this was called missing self recognition where self is self MHC. So, um, other groups actually came up with the first good candidates to be these receptors, right? There was a search for receptors like these and uh, the Live 49 and Kier. I won't burden you with the names of these things, but they were identified subsequently and they were good candidates, but it was worked by a postdoc in the lab, Werner Halt, who's now a, a professor at the University of Lausanne, who um, that really demonstrated that these function in vivo to inhibit NK function. And he did it by introducing one of the receptor genes into a mouse chromosome in a manner that resulted in all NK cells expressing that one receptor. And that receptor bound to a specific MHC variant. And he found that NK cell killing of target cells with that MHC variant was prevented. So this was a genetic demonstration that the receptor inhibited uh, recognition. This worked both in cell cultures and in intact uh, mice. So this supported this idea of inhibitory recognition. So what's the biological purpose of it? Well, uh, killer T cells recognize viral antigens and tumor antigens presented by MHC proteins. And this exerts a selective pressure for loss of MHC by mutation, for example. And you can imagine that happening in a cancer cell they have mutations in MHC and they no longer express it. They become invisible to the T cells. And viruses, it turns out, frequently interfere with MHC expression to try and hide from the, the T cell component of the immune system. In doing so, the cells become sensitive to being killed by NK cells. And so you can, you can, accept, you can uh, appreciate that NK cell killing of cells like in MHC is an evolutionary countermeasure that we've evolved over the years. Okay, so that's, that was really important steps that um, we and others made in the field to, to get this model of inhibitory recognition, but is that the whole story? And we, we thought it couldn't be. We thought NK cells must have activating receptors too, because in order to be triggered, immune cells generally need you know, some kind of activation receptor. And so the hypothesis was there was some unknown activation receptor on NK cells that engaged some kind of molecule on a target cell. And just for nomenclature purpose, a, a thing that a receptor binds to is called a ligand. So I'll use that term uh, subsequently. A, a ligand is what the receptor binds to. So we thought there must be activating receptors and we thought that um, they must recognize ligands on target cells and we wanted to identify both of those. But NK cells don't have T cell antigen receptors and they don't have antibodies. So is there something else involved? That was the question. So here's where uh, great graduate students make a big difference, and I've had many great graduate students. Some of them are here. 
Um, and um, this one uh, was, took advantage of what was happening in terms of uh, gene sequencing in the late 1990s, before the full genome sequences were, were done. Uh, random gene sequences in the late 90s began to be deposited weekly in large numbers into online databases. And Russell Vance, who many of you know, is our colleague here at UC Berkeley, uh, an esteemed colleague in our, in our department, at the time was a graduate student in the lab. And he searched the database weekly for genes with sequences related to the inhibitory receptor family he was working on. He did this on his own volition, not on my suggestion. And one day, up popped this sequence, NKG2D. And NKG2D was fascinating because it had features suggesting it might be an activating receptor. And we, we really immediately took interest and began to pursue it. So we asked, ultimately, does NKG2D bind to something on tumor cells? Is it a tumor-recognizing receptor? And this is how we did that. Um, this is the notion of a membrane, a plasma membrane of an NK cell. And here's the NKG2D receptor anchored in it. Well, it turns out by uh, you know, engineering, you can readily generate a version that's truncated and, and is soluble. It doesn't, it's not anchored in the membrane anymore. And then by doing a little bit more engineering, you could create a, what we call a multimer, but it was basically just several of them. And also it's attached to a fluorescein reagent, so it makes it uh, light up and it's fluorescent. So this could be a, a reagent, as we call it, to stain cells, and, that, and, and if, this, if it stained cancer cells, that would suggest that NKG2D binds to cancer cells. So this was uh, such an experiment, and this, this is uh, the machine we run to test this, called a flow cytometer. And on this axis is the intensity of the staining, and this is just the number of cells in each channel. And the main point is that the normal cells had negligible staining with this reagent, but the tumor cell line shown here stained very intensely. All the cells did, essentially. So this suggested, indeed, that this, uh, this receptor does bind to tumor cells. And in fact, it bound to 11 of 14 tumor cell lines that we tested. And most primary tumors were stained as well. So this is very frequently on tumor cells, whatever it's recognizing. And this immediately you know, made clear that NKG2D sees cancer cells. And then, of course, it becomes very interesting to ask, what does it see exactly on the cancer cells? And we, we wanted them to identify that. So um, to quote the Taj Mahal, the musician, many fish bite if you've got good bait. Well, we had this staining reagent, that's the, that's the bait, and we could try and use it to, to pull out the fish, which would be the gene that encodes the ligand, the thing that the receptor binds to. So basically, the way that works is that the messenger RNA from the tumor cell uh, is complex. There's 10,000 different kinds, and messenger RNA encodes proteins. And we reasoned that maybe there was a protein that was being recognized. And, um, but only one or a few of those 10,000 different kinds would bind to NKG2D. So it's a needle in a haystack, and you have to find a way to find the, the one or few that are in there that actually do that. And so the way we do this without going through details is what's called expression cDNA cloning, and we did that. And uh, we uh, succeeded in, in pulling out some, some genes. So this is a method to use the, you know, bait is the NKG2D to pull out the, the um, proteins that bind to NKG2D. So we, we pulled out a couple of different proteins, uh, one called Ray1 and H60, and again, don't worry about the names. I'll collectively call them NKG2D ligands. What was remarkable was that there's a whole bunch of them, ultimately, once they were all defined. Uh, each of us humans has eight different versions, um, and uh, they're distant relatives of the MHC proteins that I've already told you about. And they all bind to NKG2D. And what we then showed was that one of the genes was introduced into rare tumor cells that lack all of them. The tumor cells are now killed by the NK cells, so that was a kind of proof of principle. And um, indeed, if we put those tumor cells into mice, the mice rejected those tumor cells. So um, another line of evidence that this is a NK, uh, this is a cancer recognizing system, came from a graduate student, Amanda Jameson, who's, who's now a, a professor at Brown University. And uh, what she did was to generate a monoclonal antibody that binds to NKG2D. The idea was, if NKG2D is an activating receptor involved in cancer cell recognition, then an antibody that binds it may block the tumor cell recognition and tumor cell killing. 
So she made a monoclonal antibody. It took six tries and two years of spending a lot of time in the tissue culture hood. She uh, finally succeeded and she named it Mission Impossible 6 or MI6. And um, it proved to be a quite useful antibody. And, and it, this is uh, one example where what we're doing here is, is asking whether NK cells kill tumor cells. So we're adding in, in a tissue culture well, we're act, adding more and more NK cells from left to right. And then we're testing the amount of killing of the tumor cells. And as you can see in blue, that goes up. Now you repeat the experiment, but in the presence of the antibody, and you can see it completely blocked the killing. So it, it doesn't always block this successfully because it turns out that NKG2D is one of several tumor recognizing NK activating receptors, but one of the more interesting ones. Okay, so that was nice finding. Um, so ultimately in this system, we could say NKG2D ligands are kill me signals. And then the question becomes what turns them on? And um, they are self proteins. They're encoded by our own genome, our own genes. So it's not foreign recognition. The genes are off in normal cells, but on in tumor cells. And so what cellular signals turn them on in tumor cells and why became the question. Now we knew that cancer cells are highly dysregulated in numerous respects, and this leads to cellular stress. And the idea emerged in the field that maybe stress pathways induce NKG2D ligands, and we decided to, to really begin to explore that. So to get in a little more de detail, cells have what are called pathways or mechanisms to counter stress. Excessive heat will, uh, is, you, activates the so-called heat shock stress pathway. Unfolded proteins or amino acid starvation activates the integrated stress pathway. And damage to the genome, to DNA, activates the DNA damage response stress pathway. And we wondered whether those pathways were involved here. So a postdoctoral uh, fellow, uh, Stefan Gasser, joined the lab, and he decided to investigate this. And he began to specifically explore the role of the DNA damage response pathway. So let me just summarize that pathway briefly. Uh, what happens here is that there can be errors in DNA replication as cells divide, but also there can be damage to DNA from a radiation or DNA damaging chemicals. Those can cause breaks in the DNA and the genome. And um, these, are, these, these lesions, these, this damage is detected by some sensor proteins that are called ATR and ATM. So they detect the damage and then they activate a cascade of, 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 of signaling uh, events, phosphorylation events. And this leads to um, two things. First of all, you stop the cells from dividing so that you can do some work on them. And you induce the expression of DNA repair functions, which attempts to repair the damage. And repaired cells can then go on their merry way, but the uh, cells that are too seriously damaged may undergo senescence or program cell death. So that, that is the general features of the, of the um, DNA damage response pathway. The work that emerged around the time we were doing this, these studies showed that this pathway is often activated in cancer. And the reason is that in cancer, DNA uh, replication in cancer is unscheduled in effect and, and errors occur frequently in, in DNA replication and cause damage. And that can activate this pathway constitutively in many cancers. It's on all the time in many cancer cells. And so that became quite interesting that this could be a way to detect uh, cancer. And what Stefan showed that indeed this pathway induces expression of NKG2D ligands on cells and therefore killing by NK cells. And this was a really interesting finding because it connected this pathway, which had been seen really as kind of an intrinsic uh, pathway to mobilization of an immune response for the first time. So here's a way you could link cancer to expression of these you know, kill me proteins. And Stefan showed this in two different ways. One was by starting with normal cells and then damaging the DNA in them and showing they gain NKG2D ligands. And that depends on these ATR and ATM proteins. Or you take cancer cells, which express NKG2D ligands all the time, and then you inhibit uh, these, uh, these, pro these sensor proteins or you, you know, temporarily knock them out or something like that. And you, and you saw loss of NKG2D ligands. So that together made the case that indeed this pathway is important for expression. And so that you have this uh, picture then of a you know, normal tissue with a lot of cells, 
And then there's some you know, tumor formation. One of these cells goes awry and begins to accumulate. And that generates DNA damage stress that causes expression of these uh, ligands and enables NK cells to now try and kill those tumor cells. And then work by two subsequent uh, members of the lab, graduate student Benjamin Gowen and, and graduate student He Yun Yong, investigated other kinds of stress and showed that the unfolded protein stress response would induce one of the ligands or hyperproliferation would induce another of the ligands. So there seems to be a uh, system to detect different kinds of stress and to enable NK cell killing as a consequence of that. Okay, so then there's a picture emerged then of NK cells with both activating and inhibitory receptors. And um, in stress cells, you know, you increase the expression of the uh, stimulatory ligands and that can activate the NK cell to kill. But you still have these, these inhibitory receptors which can either partially or even completely prevent that. But then many tumor cells lose MHC1, it turns out. And, and so then that inhibitory signal goes away and you, and you have a, killing due to lack of inhibition in this case. So it turns out basically that loss of MHC can be sufficient for being killed. Uh, cells that strongly express these ligands, that can be sufficient for being killed. And when both things happen, the cells are really killed very efficiently. They're the best targets for, for NK cell, NK cell killing. Okay, so the next question we asked, does NKG2D play a role in immune surveillance of cancer? So the notion that the immune system often stamps out newly arising cancer was first uh, proposed by, I believe, by Paul Ehrlich in the early 1900s. Uh, and this idea was waxed and waned over the years. And, but by the 1970s, a study appeared suggesting the answer was no, and it kind of lost favor. And for 30 years, no one, no one thought much of that idea. But then around the year 2000, uh, Robert Schreiber and his colleagues basically resurrected the theory and specifically implicated T cells in immune surveillance of cancer in some cases. So that was an important uh, finding. And, but building on our findings, we hypothesized that NKG2D and NK cells play a role in immune surveillance of cancer in some instances, and we wanted to test that. So Nadia Guerra, a postdoctoral fellow, joined the lab, and uh, she's now a faculty member at the uh, ICRF in London. And she decided to investigate this question by disrupting the gene that encodes NKG2D in mice. So here, again, we use the same method I showed earlier where you can disrupt a specific gene. And in this case, she disrupted the NKG2D gene. So these mice, she could make a mutant mouse strain that lacks, specifically lacks just the NKG2D gene. Now to study cancer incidence in these mice, we would have had to look at probably thousands of mice to get to look at fully spontaneous cancer. So as a, as a way to get around that, um, the way we do the experiments is to equip the mice with oncotransgenes. And these, these are basically you know, oncogenes, cancer-causing genes that increase the incidence of specific types of cancer. And then, and then to ask the question, if we compare the normal mice that have normal NKG2D or they're NKG2D deficient, but they have the oncotransgene in both cases, would, would would this lead to more or cancer or more severe cancer? So you age the mice and you monitor cancer incidence and severity. So Nadia did this study and um, first she investigated a model of prostate cancer. And um, what we found is you know, after 10 months with this, in this model, there's a, a low frequency of, of massive early arising adenocarcinomas in the uh, mice with normal NKG2D but in the mice that lack NKG2D, it was several fold higher incidence. So really making the case that NKG2D is suppressing cancer. And then uh, she also did it in another system. This was a model of B lymphoma. And in this case, um, with time, the mice with normal NKG2D get, all get lymphoma, but they get it faster in the NKG2D deficient mice. So both of these studies support the idea that NKG2D recognition helps to eliminate some cancers spontaneously, but obviously not all of them. So if NK cells can kill cancer, why do they so often fail? That becomes the question, and what can we do about it? So we think that one reason for failure is likely to be poor initiation of the NK cell response. And that's because um, immune cells generally, when in the absence of an infection or a tumor or et cetera, are in a so-called naive state where they have little functional activity, they're kind of minding their own business, they really have to be activated to become you know, active killer cells. 
And that wasn't actually thought to be the case for NK cells, but we developed evidence that it clearly is the case that NK cells require this sort of event as well. And, and the signals that do this activation are called innate immune signals, and they emanate from the, you know, either the recognition of pathogen uh, molecules or uh, other kinds of events that signal something's wrong, and that can result in the production of goodies, if you will, you know, cytokines and other signals that lead to the activation of the NK cell. Cytokines, I should say, are basically um, hormone-like proteins that regulate immune responses. So we think, we, we began to study this, and, and again, uh, it, it's great that we have such great colleagues here, well, Russell Dance, now a faculty member, and, and Dan Portnoy, both members of our department, had do, done pioneering work in elucidating what's called the sting pathway. And this is one of these innate immune pathways where the presence of pathogens through a series of events results in the production of a, what's called a, you know, a second messenger, a small molecule inside cells that's called a cyclic dinucleotide. And I'm just gonna call it a CDN from now on. And th those small molecules bind to another, a protein in the cell called sting, stimulator of interferon genes. And that leads to the production of all these goodies. And those goodies activate immune responses. So that, that really is, is kind of how innate immunity works more broadly, but the role of this specific cyclic dinucleotides is specific to this particular pathway. So, so that was uh, an important pathway for recognizing pathogens, but uh, evidence, uh, some of it from our lab, uh, showed that in fact this happens in cancer as well. And it happens downstream of the DNA damage that I've already told you about that happens in cancer, that, that you can generate uh, signals that activate CDN production and activate this pathway. So Asaf Marcus, a postdoctoral fellow, joined the lab and he showed that that um, pathway, this, this sting pathway is essential for NK cell responses to tumors, for the spontaneous NK cell response to tumors. So that, that suggested that this really was an operative pathway for activating NK cells in, in response to cancer. But his evidence also suggested that this was a relatively weak and often insufficient pathway to strongly activate the immune response. The good news was that there are other ways to activate the pathway and work from uh, Tom Gajewski's lab and also from, from the group at uh, Aduro Biotech, including uh, Sarah McWhirter, but also um, Tom Dubensky and others, showed that if you inject cyclic dinucleotides into tumors in, in sufficient quantities, you actually super activate that pathway and you get very powerful activation of the immune response. So this is a potential therapeutic approach for cancer then. All right, but before I show you some data, another reason that NK cells fail, we believe, is a process of desensitization. So here is basically years of work we've done that shows that persistent unresolved stimulation leads to NK cell dysfunction. So the way to think about that in the context of cancer is you get an active NK cell, it goes into a tumor, if it can't, completely eliminate the tumor, it's persistently stimulated and, and they give up. You know, they, 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 uh, they give up, <laughs> NK cells give up. And, and they're dysfunctional. They can't really kill tumor cells anymore. Well, what we were investigating were ways to wake up these NK cells. And that, by the way, is still a very active area of research in my lab. I think there's much more to be done here. But uh, Michaela Ardolino, who's a postdoc in the lab, now a, a professor at the University of Ottawa, uh, decided to investigate whether he could wake them up. And he tried to do it uh, in collaboration with uh, Chris Garcia, a colleague at Stanford, uh, with a so-called superkine. So these, I mentioned cytokines are like hormone-like proteins. Well, Garcia's lab engineered an especially active form of, of one of these cytokines called interleukin-2. And this he calls a superkine. And, and Michele's work showed that this reverses NK cell dysfunction. So we could, we could restore some NK cell activity by injecting this superkine into animals. So, so that led to the, to the idea then that we could maybe do both things. We could strongly initiate the response with the CDNs. We could prevent NK cell desensitization with the superkine, it's called H9MSA. Uh, or better yet, we could combine the two things and get and hopefully get um, get um, synergistic effects. So these were studies initially carried out by um, Chris Nikolai and, and Natalie Wolf to, to show that this maybe could work. And the idea then was to inject CDNs into, into um, 
tumors and then inject superkinds into the animals and see if we could see uh, therapeutic effects against can cancer models. And so um, this turns out works great for NK cells, as I'll show you, but it works very well for T cells too. And we like the idea that we're getting sort of a one-two punch from both NK cells and T cells in this approach. So here's uh, just, uh, this is my last data slide, um, where it could be applied in a very difficult to treat colorectal cancer model. This is an MHC deficient tumor cell. There's no MHC on it, so T cells can't even recognize it. And it's very hard to cure. Um, but so what Natalie did in this experiment was in, inject the tumor cells. So the tumor becomes established and then she applies therapy beginning at day zero. And with no therapy, the, the mice are all gonna succumb. We euthanize them before they do. Um, but the tumors are growing. With the CDN or with the superkine, however, we saw this massive delay in tumor growth. So that was good news. And in fact, we cured about 20% of them in both cases. So that was also promising. But the most remarkable results were when they were combined where uh, we basically eliminated the tumors and the mice were you know, cured, cure rate of 100%, taking these mice out for many months and there's no evidence of cancer. And this was mediated solely by NK cells. T cells, T cells played no role in this response whatsoever and we were quite impressed and happy that NK cells could do such a good job on their own. So then uh, Christina Blage investigated an even harder to treat kind of cancer. This is a sarcoma cancer induced in mice by carcinogens. And sarcomas are, are an unmet need. Uh, the existing uh, checkpoint therapies that I told you about are, are ineffective in most sarcomas. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so there's not, there's not much, uh, if, if they're advancing, there's not much to do about them. And indeed, in this sarcoma model that uh, Christina investigated, that, you know, the tumors would grow. And, and as I said, the, the checkpoint therapy was completely ineffective in even delaying the tumor formation. But what was nice was that the CDN in particular had a major effect in delaying the tumors. Superkine maybe had a small effect, but we didn't get any cures here. The tumors grew out in all the mice. Uh, but when we combined them, we began to see this, again, this synergistic effect. And about 12% uh, of them lived long-term, seemed to be cured. So that was encouraging. And then we decided to say, when you, we knew that checkpoint therapy is most effective when the immune response is actually ongoing. So the idea is we're making an immune response go here. So maybe now the checkpoint therapy will, will help if we add it to the mix here. And so we did that. And that turned out to be quite remarkable. And when we combined the three agents, we saw 44% cure rate in this model. So that was really very encouraging. So, um, this, you know, we're obviously, in, we're actually exploring many different ways to, to generate uh, NK dependent immunity. I should, I should point out that this uh, rejection was mediated by both T cells and NK cells. So we're getting that, you know, one, two punch. They work together in this case, neither alone is sufficient. So we're really mobilizing both kinds of immune responses. Okay, so I'll, I'll just summarize here and I, I'm not really summarize, but just make some closing remarks about discovery science, because I think, I, think that, I think that's the way to generate effective therapies. When I was a grad student, there was one biotech, I believe, Genentech, um, and not much coming out of that at the time. Um, and developing new treatments was a dream we all had, but it was rarely a reality. Uh, we just didn't know enough. And today there are thousands of new therapeutics that were, treat myriad disorders. We basically take them for granted now. Um, and at each step, I would say the main driver has been discovery science, curiosity driven. So that's really the way these discoveries are made. We had to learn to have an eye towards applications to ask, does this finding suggest a potential therapeutic approach? J Jim's example was a good one. He asked that question instantly in his work. And I think all of us now are uh, realize that we, we can do this now and, 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 and try and do that. But there's many more of these approaches to come probably accelerating dramatically, uh, I would imagine. And, and I would point out the most important ones will still be based on curiosity-driven research. And the reason is we still have so much to learn. Occasionally you hear people say things like, we've done enough basic science, now it's time to just cure things. Well, that's stupid because there's so much we don't understand. There's so much more research to be done. And uh, that's where all these new findings will come from. And Berkeley is good at this, I have to say. When you think that, um, I would say the two 
major therapeutic uh, breakthroughs in uh, the last, I don't know how many years, uh, came out of Berkeley, Jim Allison's work on cancer, Jennifer Dowden's work on CRISPR, which is gonna have many, many applications. Uh, it's really, Berkeley's an impressive place. Not to speak of the work of everyone else uh, here at Berkeley. Okay, so um, I'll stop here and um, just acknowledge again, the, I think I shouted out all these people, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Dave, the, um, the interleukin-2, the superkine, I assume that's also promoting proliferation of the NK cells. So is there any thought to, uh, from any given patient to take out their NK cell, culture them so that the total number of NK cells that you could put back into the person to, to, to go after the tumor might, that, that might be a strategy or not? Well, there's many efforts now to uh, expand NK cells ex vivo to take them out of patient, expand them in tissue culture, make them better, even engineer them to make them better and then put them back in. A huge number of, of efforts like that are underway. So yes, I think that approach is, is widely being explored. Not gonna be able to hear you, Doug. <laughs> so, so we know that T cells have a lot of all bad side effects so the, because you know, a lot of times you kill the patient trying to treat him with a T cell. Uh, so a checkpoint. Again. I'm sorry, I don't hear very well. Too many okay. rock concerts. A lot of times you, the checkpoint therapy kills the patient. So in the NK cells, what are the sort of bad side to this great therapy you described? Yeah, so, so there, are, there is toxicity associated with checkpoint therapy. I, I don't know about a lot of times. I think, I think, as I understand it, clinicians have become better and better at recognizing the toxicity and, and, and you know, backing off when necessary. But um, yeah, there may be, there may be uh, uh, actually the notion in the field is that NK cells are likely to be much less toxic than, than uh, T cell therapy, but you know, I think that remains to be seen in, um, in actual practice. But, th but they, they, could, they could apply therapy because they make cytokines that cause you know, uh, problems, <laughs> so-called cytokine storms. But clinicians have just gotten very good at recognizing that and backing off when necessary. We have time for one more question. Hello, Professor. Thank you very much for your time and for speaking today. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but um, I guess to I guess like uh, one that I would uh, am actually curious to know is that um, that um, uh, have you ever been in like a? I know you've been experimenting on a lot on mice in your research, and uh, have you there has been ever some times uh, that uh, when you're studying uh, mice that um, that research has failed, and at what point when you are studying a certain um, study that um, there's enough failures that you just decide to pull the plug and decide to do something, do some uh, other research. I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part of that? Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry if I'm not uh, making sense here, but um, yeah, um, at what point if there's enough uh, studies that uh, turned out that experimenting on mice uh, have failed that you decide to just pull the plug on such research? At what point does it fail, did you say? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I apologize. Oh, um, sorry. I... No, it's my bad. I just, I just don't. I think sound systems here are never very good, and I don't hear very well. No, no, no. You're fine. Sorry. Say it again. Ah. Well, when nothing happens, that would be one, uh, <laughs> one indication. I mean, I mean, it's certain. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's certainly the case that when, when um, you know, these drugs are translated into humans, they sometimes don't work, often don't work actually, but so that's obviously a key step, but of course that's not something we do in a university laboratory that has to be done, um, you know, usually outside and usually in industry actually. Um, so that's, that's a key step that there's often issues with because, you know, human cancer is, um, you know, a little different and, but again, one of the reasons, we, one of the ways we try and deal with that is to use 
models of cancer in mice that are perhaps more uh, similar to human cancer by, for example, the, the, the carcinogen model I mentioned is it really involves initiation of the cancer in a natural environment. And, and, and that's really more similar to human cancer than some of the other models that people use in mice. Thank you.